Hello, friends, and welcome to another video. Today, we're gonna be trying on five historical wedding dresses because I wanna play dress up just a little. Now, as some of you might know, I am engaged, betrothed, affianced. Am I going to say that at the beginning of every wedding related video? Probably. And Tyler and I are in the midst of planning our own wedding, which by the time this video goes up may have already happened. We're in the last couple of weeks of wedding planning over here. It's fine. I'm fine. But while we've been planning our own wedding, the fashion history enthusiast inside of me has become more and more curious about weddings through the ages, and specifically wedding dresses through the ages, because everyone knows the best part of a wedding is the dress. Sorry, Tyler. The marriage part is good too. Now, people have been getting married for a very long time since pretty much the beginning of civilization to consolidate resources and secure inheritance for love, Love, well, mostly the consolidate resources part, but also love. And what people wore to their weddings throughout history has varied greatly based on cultural traditions and changing fashion trends. Like in ancient Rome, brides used to wear yellow veils to represent light and warmth. And in medieval Europe, blue was a popular color for wedding dresses because of its association with purity and the Virgin Mary. I've got a lot of these kinds of facts up my sleeve. In Tang Dynasty era China, people used to wear green to their weddings. See? I told you. So I thought it would be interesting to try on a few vintage and or vintage replica wedding dresses, probably from eras a little more recent than ancient Rome, to get a peek into the wedding traditions and fashion trends of the time. Now, to do this, we chose five eras that we thought had fun and different wedding dresses to try on. And just a disclaimer, because there are so many different kinds of wedding dresses like out there in the world, we decided decided to focus on mostly Western wedding dresses from the last 150 years. Also, because we wanted to use authentic, like actually vintage wedding dresses, most of them are no longer tennis sneaker white. In fact, they're mostly cream because, well, they old. And to not drag these old wedding dresses out and about Los Angeles, we decided to get like a legit filming space just to protect them. So we are here on this white psych in this studio. Just FYI, we're here. Now, to help us achieve our historical wedding dress dreams, we recruited a couple of professionals to collaborate with us. Someone to help us source the dresses. This is Olivia, who is our costume designer. These are also some of the dresses back here, so don't look at them. It's a surprise slash Lock them out, yeah. Yes. Great. As well as someone to help us finish off our bridal looks. And this is Cece, who's gonna be doing the hair and makeup today. There are a lot of wigs prepped to my left. We're gonna wig out. Let's get wiggy with it. Uh, that's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. And once we had everything prepped and ready to go, it was time to get bridal-fied. Our first dress took us all the way back to the late Victorian era, the 1890s to be specific, for a seriously poofy-sleeved bridal moment. I right now feel a little bit like the murderous bride at the end of Disney's Haunted Mansion. Till death do us part. <laughs> We decided to start with the Victorian era because it's sort of like when white became the go-to bridal color for dresses, as Queen Victoria herself set the trend by wearing white to her wedding in 1840. Now that said, for the better part of the era, white fabric was still kind of hard to come by, but by the 1890s, improvements in the textile industry had made it a little more affordable for the general public. So all of the dresses besides this one are like authentic vintage from the time period, we could not find an 1890s dress that would fit my 2010s frame. So this dress we did construct and we did make it a little creamier colored rather than just like stark white, just so it looked a little closer to 125 years old. Now for this look, we went with a full length, long sleeved, high necked wedding gown with a band at the waist and a lacy ruff, as well as a white bouquet with some foliage and a long classic tulle veil. All right, I think I'm gonna de-veil myself. Oh, avoid the boom mic, avoid the boom mic. And keep going. Medium success. Keep going. Good thing we don't have to do this on our wedding day. Keep going. <laughs> Overall, I think this look is actually pretty awesome. I am a big fan of interesting and dramatic sleeves, and I feel like this is definitely one of those. It looks like you're wearing pool floaties a little bit. I feel that vibe. These giant poofy dudes came back into fashion in the early 1890s and were called leg of mutton sleeves, which 
Yes, got their name from the shapely buttocks of a sheep, and were meant to be a sort of menswear-inspired look. It's almost like a, a oh. rendition of the travel pillow, where you just you sleep on top of it. You mean I could just take a nap on my sleeve? Yeah. Perhaps like this? I guess I could, yeah. Just throw that idea. No, it's not, it's not the worst idea you've had. Hamaker Schlemmer is considering it, Sharper Image is considering it, Sears said no. The Victorian era was known for quickly and constantly changing silhouettes, but they all pretty much had the same intended goal of showing off just how much fabric you could afford and making your waist look small. I am not currently wearing a corset. I am wearing Spanx, the modern corset. So that is making this dress situation probably a lot more comfortable for me. As for my makeup, well, I'm not wearing a lot of it, which was reflective of the Victorian perspective on makeup in general. Uh -oh. You didn't want to look painted? You didn't want to be a painted woman? You didn't want to look like you were tricking anyone into thinking that you were something that you were not. That was the 1890s version of take her swimming on the first date. A lot of women still used beauty products, but since buying and applying makeup in public was a big no-no, a lot of makeup and skincare was DIY'd. So you had things like homemade toner and rouge, and even homemade eyebrow pencils made by burning cloves. That is on fire. It is on fire. Sort of like a vintage Instagram hack or a Troom Troom video. Need to fill in your eyebrows? It's not a problem anymore. The hair of the period was sort of the opposite of the makeup, as it was very done up and clearly effortful. Oh my word. And for hours, we went with a curly style piled on top of the head, with a few tendrils cascading down the back. Slight mullet vibes in the current time. There's nothing wrong with mullet vibes. Now, just like a mullet is business in the front and party in the back, the Victorian era was awesome austere to begin, and started getting a little more fun near the end. In fact, the 1890s were dubbed the Gay 90s, which at the time translated to Fun 90s, as the strict social codes of the time loosened and women started doing more things outside of the home. I mean, just look at how much fun they're having. They've got like an obstacle course going. Weddings also became more fun, as celebrations evolved from somber church affairs to like actual parties that you would have at your house, with food food and games and maybe a little dancing. I could really nail a chicken dance in this thing. You would crush it. I am crushing it right now, even half-assedly. I'm crushing it. Probably not a chicken dance, though I can't say that for sure. Apparently throwing shoes at the newly married couple was also a fun 1890s wedding tradition, but since I didn't want to ruin my dress or get a black eye, we stuck with some rice. All right, gra grab a little more. That's what I'm talking about. That was a good throw. There's some in your hair. Yeah, that's why we did this last. All right, now we're gonna have to vacuum that, but I would say it was worth it. Now for our next look, bye. See ya. We jumped forward about 30 years. So this is my 1920s bridal look. I thought we had to try on a 20s dress because pretty much everything about the 20s, fashion-wise and otherwise, was completely new. If by the end of the 19th century, social codes had started to loosen, by the 1920s, the corset was off, with the emergence of the newly independent flapper girls, hitting the town and the speakeasies in their short hair and short hemlines. And flapper fashion definitely bled into bridal fashion, as you can see with my scandalously exposed ankles. It's extremely inappropriate. <laughs> I would have highly offended the previous version of myself. As well as my great Gatsby style dangly jewelry. I think that the earrings make you look pretty ready to like gallivant around Long Island Sound. East egg, west egg, is Whatever that what they're called? Whatever egg it is, yeah. <laughs> hard boiled egg, yeah. Hard boiled egg. I am Sophia of hard boiled egg. <laughs> Besides a shocking ankle ankle reveal, our look included a loose, long-sleeved lacy dress. There's not a low waistline, there is no waistline. T-strap shoes, pantyhose, a half-moon manicure, a large gathered veil, and a lacy headpiece. In general, I am loving this look. I love the little hat crown situation, and also, oh, oh my god. Veil down, down, veil down. Headgear was a pretty key element of the 1920s look, and many brides incorporated that into their wedding day. Day, oftentimes pairing it with very long Juliet cap style veils. This is like sort of an interesting mix of like a crown and like a small 20s like hat. It's like a trident on my head. 
Now, the clear elephant in the room is the giant bouquet. This bouquet is so big and heavy. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Oh my God, I'm nervous. It's gonna like drag on the ground. 1920s bouquets were often very large. I just need like a firm grip on it. Yeah. It's pretty girthy with cascading details like ribbons, bows, and or even more flowers. It's kind of like a ball and chain, right? Interestingly enough, in the 1920s, engagement rings were referred to as handcuffs. I will abstain from saying anything. <laughs> no, just kidding. Watch it. Just kidding, just kidding. Banks closed. So I sort of took turns holding it and not holding it because I wasn't quite prepared for the sheer mass of it. Here we go, let's see. Oh, that's weighty. That's weighty, that'll get your forearm strong. Yeah. Forget the shake weight. That's all you need right there. Now for the face, the trend in the 20s was pretty much the complete opposite of the Victorian era as women started embracing makeup publicly for the very first time. All the makeup was a bit rounded. The eyes were rounded, the cheeks were rounded, mm -hmm. even the lips were rounded into that kind of Cupid's bow look. The movie industry was booming. And whereas actresses had previously been considered women of ill repute, Silent movie stars were idolized and used as spokespeople for the burgeoning makeup industry. And things like thin, arched eyebrows, which stars used to express emotion without talking. Wow. They're skinny. They're skinty. And dark lipstick, used because lighter lipstick would turn out gray on screen, all became trends for everyday women as well. My mouth shape looks so different. It's kind of tripping me out, actually. And so we couldn't help trying some silent movie acting ourselves. You have acid indigestion. <laughs> it's an old school Pepto-Bismol commercial. Yeah, no, I'm gonna give you commercial thoughts. Um, With a variety of prompts. You just saved 15% or more on your car insurance, but you don't even know what a car is. No, there were cars. <laughs> hey. Hey, wait, I can't hear you. <laughs> oh, it's the 1920s version of Shook. Besides the makeup, bobbed hair was also a new and thoroughly modern look, which many women adopted. I think what's interesting to me about the 20s in general is how just like everything was subversive. Yeah. It's like short hair, edgy. Wearing makeup, edgy. Showing your ankles, edgy. And following that theme, weddings also experienced a bit of a shakeup as courthouse ceremonies and elopements became more socially acceptable choices. Another cool thing about weddings in the 1920s is that ladies started walking themselves down the aisle for the first time, which uh, kind of makes sense. You need room for the bouquet. Though despite these new casual wedding options, one has to imagine that in the roaring 20s, there were still some raging parties. Is, are you doing the Carlton? The Carlton? <laughs> Am I doing the Carlton, he asks. Though I was a little nervous about partying with my precarious tiara. I'm almost doing like an Irish step dance version of the Charleston where I'm like, don't move the upper body. And we certainly were not gonna be doing the Carlton. Uh-oh, here it comes, and caught. Got it. <laughs> So after exploring the 20s, our next step through history brings us to the 1940s with this jazzy, T-length, shoulder padded look. I feel very like, I guess, is swanky an appropriate word? I feel very like, hmm. Now, of course, in the first half of the 1940s, people around the world were greatly affected by World War II and wartime had some pretty dramatic effects on marriage and weddings and fashion. I think that there was a fair amount of variation in wedding dresses in the 40s, depending on when and where and how quickly you were getting married. There are some more like full length gowny type situations. And then there are some more like casual wedding dresses. A lot of people were trying to tie the knot, but didn't have a lot of time or materials. With unpredictable soldiers leave schedules and rationing or the diverting of resources to the military. So they had to make do with what they could. For example, our dress is more of a Sunday's best courthouse appropriate situation. I actually really love this dress. I love the shoulder pad. I love the little like, I don't even know what this is, like apron and um, the belt also is very nice and cinchy. Shoulder pads were a common fixture in 40s style, mirroring menswear as women entered the workforce to fill in for soldiers overseas. There is also a really cool thing 
on my butt. What is it? It's literally a curtain for my booty. Just imagine like the uh, MGM lion just roaring right there. Exactly, yes. just right out of my butt. <laughs> Besides that, we also have an intricate neckline situation going on. The 40s is also when like bullet bras and kind of like pointy boobed sweater girls were in fashion. So maybe they're trying to create like a, a literal just like pointy shelf. It's just like, it's very, it's square. Aside from our dress, we also went with some pearl jewelry and and also appropriate for the 40s half moon manicure, a small bouquet of white flowers, and an elbow length triangular veil on the back of my head. Cause you don't got time for one of those long train veils. Ain't nobody got time for that. We gotta get to the courthouse. Underneath the veil for my hair, we went with a sort of variation on victory rolls with less of a defined roll shape and more just like quaffed volume atop my head with a little carnation on top. Boom, she's ready to rock. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling myself. Now, by the 1940s, makeup was no longer the radical statement of a modern woman and had become a staple of everyday fashion and grooming. And the makeup item of the decade was lipstick. It's so interesting how like lipstick was used as kind of like a sign of like patriotism. In particular, the US government encouraged women to wear victory red lipstick to boost morale and vibrant lip colors were used to kiss letters sent to soldier sweethearts over by the late 1940s, 90% of women used lipstick. Interestingly enough, lipstick was also one of the few items that escaped rationing in the US during the war, unlike a lot of the other things you needed for a wedding. For instance, there wasn't a lot of silk to make wedding dresses out of, since they were using that silk to make parachutes. This led not only to shorter and smaller dresses, but also to more DIY or hand-me-down ones. You'd wear like your friend's dress or your mom's dress or a dress that you already had. And rationing became a big part of everyday life and culture. Apparently, if you say, hi, sugar, are you rationed? It means, are you going steady? Like, are you dating someone? Oh, <laughs> well, you know, I'm about to be rationed for life. Yeah. We didn't like that? No, no I liked it. I was gonna say. You're the one who has to like it, so. Besides rationing though, it seemed like smaller dresses were also popular because they literally allowed you to be more mobile. From everything I've read, it seems like there were short windows in time when soldiers were home. So literally people wrote that like having a dress that could easily get on a bicycle to go to the courthouse fast was imperative. Not only were weddings planned quickly, the speed of the wedding itself was important so your sweetheart didn't get called back to service suddenly before the license could be signed. You look ready to rock. You know, you look like you could be a speedy bride. Yeah, I, I'm, I feel speedy. You just jog down the aisle. Cash me outside, how about that? And I will say that this dress is more aerodynamic than the previous two. Me on the bicycle. But although the weddings were supposed to be fast, they were also supposed to be fun, highlighted with lots of big band music and dancing. You see me with different hair colors, like Christina Aguilera, from Candyman. But unfortunately, neither Tyler nor I really know how to do the Lindy Hop. Hi. You're sweaty. <laughs> I can smell you from here. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's okay, I don't smell very good either. I've been wearing a lot of old dresses in a row. We're just smelly, that's why we have to marry each other. <laughs> Regardless of our swing dancing ability, for our next outfit, we swung into the 60s for a mini skirted fashion forward wedding look. There are so many things happening right now. Number one on my mind is my giant hair, followed closely by my giant earrings and then giant faux fur coat. 1960s fashion, including but not limited to bridal fashion, was all over the place, with many different styles entering the mix, as well as a lot of people looking to express themselves through their clothing. Similar to the 1920s, like one of the flagship fashion things about the 60s is the hemline, and that is that it went up. The mini skirt was a trademark of the mod style, which when it first started off, stood for fans of modernist jazz, but eventually became synonymous with modern fashionable young people, of which style icon Twiggy was the queen bee. The twigs. The return of Thicky. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thicky 2 electric boogaloo. And the mini, as like the silhouette of the future, became so widespread that many brides in the 60s opted for a short wedding dress to make a pretty bold fashion statement. This look in particular is inspired specifically by Raquel Welch's wedding look, in which she wore a lacy or crocheted mini dress and a big faux fur jacket. But besides the mini skirt, there were also a lot of other things going on with 60s bridal fashion. Now, I think something about 60s wedding dresses was that pretty much anything went, like colorful wedding dresses, space race inspired looks, very floral dresses, amongst many, many others, including what I can only describe as a crocheted condom. And yes, that was supposed to be a wedding dress. You look like a little, like this basically, with your head sticking out. Now, besides the mini length of my lacy dress, this look also included some blocky heels, sizable geometric dangly earrings, a small bouquet of daisies, and a large cream-colored fuzzy jacket. I think the faux fur jacket, besides being appropriate for a late fall wedding, <laughs> is also very 60s-ish because there was a sort of um, obsession? Affinity? Affinity for furs because of a few different movies including Dr. Zhivago. Yeah. Zhivago. One of the two. Trivago. Which was a super popular movie set in early 20th century Russia, so there were a lot of furs being worn. Jacket, Zhivago, Hotel, Trivago. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that right? Now for my face, we tried to recreate a version of Priscilla Presley's wedding makeup look, which features an intricate double eyeliner cut crease situation, as well as some big ol' fake lashes. Ooh, that's cool. Well, you got dolly eyes. To top off our makeup look, we also added a light pink lipstick, as lighter colors and even white lipstick were super in during the time. Frosted was very popular also. Frosted lips, frosted tips, just kidding. Mm -hmm. That was later. That was 90s. Now as for the other fuzzy part of the look, my hair, we went with a long, sort of bouffanted in the back situation. Woo! <laughs> Priscilla, is that you? Which, as you can tell, ended up very, very teased and tall. Oh. Sorry. 60s are back, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> By Priscilla Presley, did you mean Tracy Turnblatt? <laughs> <laughs> and besides having actual roots in reality, my hair was also giving off some Austin Powers vibes. Kind of like a fembot hairstyle. <laughs> we did fail to equip my boobs with actual rocket launchers. I love it. <laughs> though that's probably for the best. I like this look a lot. I don't necessarily feel like I'm wearing a wedding look, but I do feel very 1960s, <laughs> exceedingly 1960s. In general, I felt sort of like a jet setting bride with my, I wanna wear a mini skirt, but the Pan Am jet is cold look, but Tyler thought I looked more like a seafaring bride. You know what? You look like you could be on Gilligan's Island. What's her name, Ginger? You could be Ginger. But that's more tropical, this is more, Russia. So you can go to Gilligan's Tundra? Gilligan's Tundra. That is the sitcom that I star in. Coming to YouTube Premium next fall. Maybe. So for our final bridal outfit, we went with this very subtle 1980s look. Just kidding, it's obviously crazy. I am so covered in beads and pearls, I don't know what to do. I'm just, it's just, it's all over me. What to react to, is a truly. The 1980s were a very big decade for fashion. Sorry, I meant a decade for very big fashion, as everything got larger and brighter. From hair, to blazers, to eyeshadow, to dresses, to, well, everything. Just everything. And bridal fashion was no exception, as gowns got poofier, rufflier, and blingier. If I was wearing this on our wedding day, would you still marry me? Oh, I, hard yes. <laughs> Oh, sorry, no. Hard I do. Oh. <laughs> now, this look includes a colorful pink and yellow bouquet, a giant headpiece situation that we'll talk about in a second, and a high-necked, long-sleeved, beaded mermaid-style satin finish dress. It's kind of hilarious to me that all of the other dresses have, like, aged naturally over the years, and this dress is still white. It's a lot younger than the 20s dress, but I'm not sure it will ever beige. Olivia, what do you think this dress is made out of? Ooh, a pastiche of polyester. A pastiche of polyester, there we go. <laughs> it's like a Twinkie. 
It's gonna be <laughs> it's gonna be here with the cockroaches. This dress will outlive us all. Definitely. Now our look was inspired by this wedding shoot that Cindy Crawford did that blessed us with many an epic 80s bridal fashion moment. But I think that most 1980s matrimonial style was inspired by Princess Diana. Her 1981 royal wedding garnered 750 million live viewers, and people around the world adored her roughly wedding gown. And record-breaking train. Even if they did take the look and run with it to more rhinestoned places. Something that's kind of funny about this dress is that the sleeves are slight leg of mutton sleeves. So there is kind of like a return to traditional or like Victorian looks like incorporated into this dress, but 80s fied. Interestingly enough, Diana had notably been inspired by the bridal looks of royal family members past for her gown. So it's all kind of coming full circle. It's the circle of sheep butt. As for my head, we ended up using my hair as a sort of latch for the veil situation and put it up in a top bun. No sock involved. All natural bun action. All natural bun <laughs> action. And for the makeup, we decided to go with soft washes of color, like violet for the eyes, smoked out eyeliner, blended out contour. Yes, chisel the double chin, yes. And sweeping pink blush all over the cheeks. Which brings us to what's on top of my head, which is this thing. It's it's the Brett Michaels of veils. For sure. Cece constructed our headpiece in two parts. The tool part in the back. It's literally, literally on top of the bun. A giant, like, Christmas bow <laughs> on top of my head. And the lace headband with flowers and cascading beads in the front. Oh, my lanta. This is amazing. Yeah, these are all made from stuff from Michaels. So, you know, get your craft on. Every item from Michaels hot glued together. This is the Frank and Michaels. Besides the headpiece, the other element of the outfit that really puts it over the top is the detachable train. Is the uh, train heavy, Soth? Could you make it down an aisle, Sophia? Oh, no, it's actually not that heavy. It is a little bit like playing a game of snake with myself. Like, I don't want to step on my own train. No, that'd be bad. But besides that, I feel good about it. Which ostensibly comes off for partying purposes. Overall, though it's hard to say with a modern eye, I do think this dress is pretty awesome. What I'll say is I'm definitely enjoying myself wearing this. But if it looks good or not is a question that could be asked. I like the pseudo bride ninja because like the headband, it looks like you could like do like a flying crane kick and knock somebody out. I see where you're going with that, but it is probably the least stealthy outfit anyone could ever wear. I'm like a cat with like a bell on its neck. Like, you could find me. Because if it's not the rustling of the polyester that gives it away, it might be the brief electric guitar solo that plays every time this dress enters a room. I waddle this way. That's the uh, wedding version of walk this way. <laughs> So those were our five wedding dresses through history. I had a real blast putting these looks together with the help of our wonderful costume designer and makeup artist, and I thought it was super cool tracking how bridal style has evolved over nearly 150 years. In particular, I think it's interesting how things fluctuate and get recycled, like hems go up and down, and sleeves get puffed and then deflated and then reinflated, because as social decorum and tastes change, fashion kind of does a circle. It's also interesting how certain things like veils and bouquets are always included in bridal looks, but change in small ways over time. Overall, it's hard for me to pick just one favorite look from the bunch, though I will say I'm partial to the silhouette of the 40s dress and to the veil of the 80s look. None of them really reflect the style of the dress that I've chosen for my wedding, but they do make me feel confident that in a 100% wedding fire drill, as in if my dress just implodes, I could throw one of these on and have a last minute themed wedding. I mean, hopefully that doesn't happen, but Tyler did say he likes the Karate Kid veil. Thank you guys so much for watching, and once again, a huge thank you to Olivia, Cece, and our friends at Ginger Snap Florals for helping us achieve our historical wedding dress dreams. If you liked that video, make sure to shamash that like button, and if you want to see more videos like this, make sure to shamash that subscribe button. A big shout out to Annika for watching. Thanks for watching, Annika, and I will see you guys next time.